Hey guys, it's Luke Johnson for Noetic, the Humanities Teaching App. Go download it for iPhone and Android devices. Tonight, CJ Eller and Jordan Klein are going to help us navigate through the labyrinth that is Borges' The Garden of Forking Paths. Um, I experienced this essay as a uh, high school senior. It was way over my head. And I can imagine that there are a lot of individuals out there who um, probably feel the same way. Um, before we get into, I, I believe we should do a summation of it because not everyone has read it and this might be the first introduction to it and they, it may inspire them to go and read it. Um, before we do that, I think we should go around and we should each sort of talk about our experiences with this text. Do we like it? Do we hate it? What do we find in the process of doing preparation for a seminar on it? So why don't we go uh, uh, CJ, Jordan, then myself. Okay. Well, a lot of... Borges' stories are dealing with ideas. And I think sometimes we can be scared that if we give away everything, if we give away the details of the story, that in some way we are going to give away the key secret or the key reason why you would read such a book or read such a short story. But in a way with Borges, it's... It's not that case that even if we do give the plot away, there is mm -hmm. still so much more that we're going to uncover. I mean, the plot's only going to be I don't know a mere a mere glimpse in the time that we're going to spend discussing the ideas that are embedded in the story. And that's one thing that I think is wonderful about Borges is that he in in such a small compact space he can load a story with so much detail and so much richness and so much intellectual curiosity that it just leaves one, at least me, in this sort of ecstasy field experience where I'm just shaking my head and laughing to myself in a way of, oh my god, oh my god, what, he, he just did that, oh my god, he just did that. Yeah. Exactly in that monotone way. But... I just want to have that as a caveat, but I I enjoy Borges. I love him. He, he's he is my favorite author. Period. Yeah. Favorite writer. Period. So this is a real treat to be able to discuss him with you all. So I definitely I've definitely understood why after reading this and doing some research on it. What about you, Jordan? What do you think? Yeah, and I mean uh, to CJ's point, I mean I can see why he's your favorite writer. There's with with Borges, there's always this sort of like surface level, and you're like, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, moving along, got it, check, yeah. check. But then there's so many layers to him. There's so much depth. So there's all there's for me, it's kind of uh, it's really it's a great dizziness, but I kind of almost get dizzy from <laughs> from reading him because yeah. there's so much I know that I don't know about the text, mm -hmm. and that always makes me want to like dig a little bit more. Yeah. So that makes me wish that I had more time to work with this text and have it work on me. Yeah, and there, I mean to go with that as well. There's so m he is as much as he's a great writer, he is probably more so a fantastic reader. He has he he his head is filled with so many references and so many philosophers' ideas, so many poets' ideas, so many. I don't know, just so many ideas that he can pull from different things, and Luke is going to help us tease out certain ideas of time that he goes through in this work. But he's pulling from so much, and I think that's what lends to some of his magic, is that he is such a fantastic reader that he can pull from all of these sources. And as a scholar, he can be a fantastic storyteller because he can mishmash all these different ideas together. Right. So I, I would say, um, without too much more of a, a preface into this, because there's a lot of ground to cover given yeah. the, the depths that he includes within this essay, is that uh, I read this seven times. Okay, mm. And each time I read this essay, I got something new out of it. And in a way, you could start talking about the concept of how this thing creates infinite worlds, right? Mm -hmm. Just when I think I have an understanding of the narrative, a new sort of reality, a new layer gets introduced. That's just slightly different than the original one. Mm -hmm. And I wonder uh, if, if I taught this for like 50 years, if it would just go on to infinity, which is a big concept we're going to talk about in this essay is the idea of 
the infinite. Yeah, right? I mean, that goes back to the pure Menard thing, right? Where the act of reading can be something that is renewed each time if you have a different mm-hmm. wrinkle of the text exposed mm-hmm. or if you look at it in a different way. So yeah. I think it goes along with Borges' so, ideas. So seven reads and seven seven different worlds or timelines yeah. that I encountered with this. So let me get a, a, a little bit of a historical background for us. And this is going to, these notes are a synthesis from a couple sources. Um, the first uh, is just Wikipedia. The second, uh, I really enjoyed this uh, summation from Ms. History Wizard on YouTube, <laughs> and then my own reading. So um, it's a 1941 Borges' essay, and it wasn't translated into English until 1948. Was it an essay or short story? Uh, you mean short story, maybe? Uh, it, I think it sort of, I think it frustrates categorization. <laughs> uh, oh, right, because, okay, so frame it. Yeah, how is, what is this that we're dealing with? Is it a manuscript, right, from... A certain... It's fiction. Right. It's a, it's a fictitious essay. I mean, we're a short story. I don't right. know. Oh, sure, sure. No, the categories saying, are... Yeah. What's the frame? What are we dealing with? What is this document we're looking at? Uh, well, what we're looking at... Um, we're looking at, again, something that what Borges does throughout all the other things, right, is that we're looking at an amalgamation of different ways of telling something, right? Uh-huh. So we get a bit of a historical narrative as if it's relayed to us by a history textbook. Mm-hmm. And then we get sans the first couple pages, we get a confession or a journal entry from mm. uh, the main character, Sun, this chi- this Chinese spy that's a- operating on the behalf of the German government. And then, it, and then um, we also get what will be revealed. I'm giving away some of the plot that we get there. We're, we're, we get a little bit of the Garden of Forking Paths, which was the labyrinth that Sun's ancestor worked on. Unbeknownst to him, he thought he was working on a physical maze mm-hmm. and a book separately. But it turns out that the maze and the book are one and the same. And the book is actually the Garden of Forking Paths. And we get some excerpts from that. Specifically, there's a in chapter 3, the hero lives. In chapter 4, the hero dies of that book. And no one can make any sense of it. And everybody thought that Sun's ancestor was like this terrible novelist or whatever. And then I believe there's... A, oh, and there's also a personal correspondence from Sun's uh, uh, ancestor that wrote mm-hmm. the Garden of Forking Paths that... Um, is re- revealed to, to Sun um, by a sonologist of the name of Dr. Stephen Albert. Now, let me connect all these things together. So we yeah. have at least four different types of writing. Um, so maybe it starts off like an essay, and then it shapeshifts mm-hmm. into a, a short story. Yeah. Um, I think the category is going to break down. It'll be interesting to see how I slot this on the Noetic app. But let me give a let me let me connect some some dots here. Okay, so all right, um, so it. it, it it starts off, or, or we get these, without these first two pages, we get we get this confession from Dr. Yu Sun, right? And I've mentioned that he was a spy for the German Empire. Now, what's interesting, why? And what was, so, so Sun, so Sun comes to an apartment and realizes that he, the end for him is, is near, right? There is a mile five British agent that's after him named, named Richard Madden. Right, and he knows that it is inevitable that he's going to be captured by the opposition, and that he is going to be arrested and killed and all of that. Right. So, but but Sun knows something. What does Sun know? Sun has a secret, yeah, a yeah. secret that he needs to desperately convey out, to yeah. the German Reich. What is it? It is, isn't it the the not the plot of something, but it's a, a town it's that. A- isn't it a location for artillery? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's the location for a British artillery park. Yeah. Okay, and I'll, and so I'll fit all these pieces together, right? So he's he, only he knows what that <laughs> that that place is, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so he devises a plan. Mm-hmm. He has a few items, right? Those items, are, by the way, are probably significant. You know, I don't know. I, I'm trying to remember them all off the top of my head. There's the a, most important one. There's this. All right, so there's. Well, I'll lead up to it. The ones I can remember. <laughs> There's a square coin. Yeah, I mean. That's interesting. A square coin. It's a bit of a paradox. Also intimates chance. Okay. What else is there? There's a revolver with one, one bullet. bullet. Right. A revolver yeah. with one bullet. What else is there? An American watch. A watch. Mm. All right. So we get, the, we get the theme of time very early mm. on in this. Okay. So... All right, so he picks up, he devises this desperate plan. We don't really know what he's going to do. He picks up the phone book, 
and he finds the name of someone we he find he puts his finger on someone named Albert and it's, it's Dr. Stephen Albert okay and he he makes a plan he boards a train and he he climbs this road to Dr. Stephen Albert's place and on the way to there right lots of things happen to him there but yeah. but generally what ha- he he gets to Dr. Stephen Albert's and he realizes that he is a sinologist okay that's important what's a sinologist Jordan do you know what a sinologist is uh someone who studies chinese culture yeah totally so what an amazing coincidence, right? Mm-hmm. Like, Sun is Chinese, right? Mm-hmm. And he's and he's uh, uh, meeting up with this person who knows Chinese culture. Not only that, but he knows Sun's ancestor's book, The Garden of Forking Paths, which I alluded to earlier that no one can make sense of. Let's pause for a second and ask ourselves, why is a Chinese man acting on behalf of the German government to tell them where... The British Artillery Park is. Why is that happening? Yeah, what, what what's what's the motivation there? You guys a, recall? It's a really odd reason. You have to give it away. It's not because he loves his barbarous country, yeah. right? He <laughs> he thinks the Germans are barbarians, and he understands that the man that is hunting him, Richard Madden, he knows that he's pr- he's a Scotsman, right? Mm-hmm. And that he's probably motivated by similar motives. He is trying to fight against the stereotype that. In his words, I believe in my edition, it says it says yellow man or Chinaman or something like that. It's not politically correct, but that's what the words say. He wants to fight the German concept that an Asian person is not intellectually evolved enough to carry out such an elaborate act of espionage. He cares nothing for what side he's on in the in in this in this in the first world war. This happens in 1916. Mm-hmm. But what he's trying to do is to communicate that he can be this representative for all his ancestors, for every person of the orient that he's smart enough to execute this elaborate act of espionage, mm-hmm. right? And he thinks that Madden might because the Scots were I believe Jordan, you're our historian here. Were they not persecuted by uh, the English at some point? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. That's what Braveheart's about or something, maybe? Uh, yeah? Was Braveheart a Scotsman? Yeah, I would say like in the 1740s, that's when the English really came down on right. the Scots like a hammer. So Madden is a Scotsman. He may have similar reasons to prove to the British that he is not an inferior being on some oh, level. Oh, my translation says an Irish man. Oh, an Irish man. Well, the, Brit- the, 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 the Brits managed to colonize a lot of different people. Mm-hmm. So, any, anywho, um, right? I mean, the the enemy of my enemy is my friend, or something like that. In Braveheart, don't they embrace oh, I mean, someone? Even even more more so. I mean, the Irish had a lot of rightful animosity towards the English. Right. Okay. So, um, so the sinologist uh, lets him know that he's sort of discovered the the secret of the Garden of Forking Paths. Um, let's see here. Um, okay. So let's talk. Let's pick up the plot and see what happens there. So, Son and Doctor Stephen Albert they, they they have this very friendly relationship. He they bond over the fact that he knows so much about his ancestor and makes sense of the Garden of Forking Paths because like his ancestor spent like thirteen years doing this and it wasn't for a waste. There was some real thing that he was trying to communicate, and the real thing that he was trying to communicate was something about the nature of time itself. Mm-hmm. All right, and there are many theories of time which I will go into as soon as I can get my Google Docs to work correctly. But um, there are many theories of time that he considers, how, like, and, and specifically how time could be infinite. He talks about it in terms of maybe the Garden of Forking Pass, the novel could be circular in some way, right? Mm-hmm. Where the last page is the first, and you, infinity is just going around in a circle. True detective, time is a flat circle, something of that effect, right? Or maybe there's the Nietzschean idea of eternal return, or the the idea of a right. big bang and then a collapsing, and we just go on for sure. eternity. Or a finite, a finite amount of things going infinitely yeah. around, right? Yeah. And they have to repeat. Right. So the so really, but the book itself reveals the, the nature of time that that his ancestor was trying to communicate. And this n- nature of time was that time is not necessarily. I'll just allude to these briefly. If you're very interested, you can follow me on Facebook and you can see my explication of the Leibnizian view, uh, David Lewis's modal realism, um, uh, Boethius's view from Constellation of Philosophy. Um, 
this the idea is what will be taken up by a philosopher named uh, Deleuze or Deleuze, uh, known as the rhizomatic theory of time. And essentially, and, it, and and Borges doesn't say this, but it matches up pretty well in my estimation. And the idea is this: that time doesn't really have a center; it's a central, right? So wherever you enter it is the middle, right? It's like jumping into like a puddle that is expanding, but. A, a, a rhizome is like not like the branching of a tree that like goes out in an infinite amount of directions all right a rhizome like the ginger root or something like that can go out and then collapse back in on itself right so like there can be diverging timelines and then there can be this sort of collapsing right mm -hmm. so this will come to explain some phenomena that i have some textual support for or, or whatever so 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 time is amorphous eccentric spreading co coalescing right right this is a very unusual concept of time so they have this bond he's like in one universe you're my friend and another your enemy mm -hmm. and then they come back together and you're both something to this effect right mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and and the sinologist goes into his desk he wants to show him something right we don't know exactly what it is i have i postulated that he too may be reaching for something and what happens what happens there at the end? Someone want to cap it off? He shoots him. Who shoots who? So Sun shoots Albert. What does he say right before he shoots him? I can't remember. I am your friend. Oh. And then he sh pop, and he says, I shot him with one bullet, and he fell down like he got struck by lightning. Just t t felt no pain, and he died. Why did he do this? Let's bring it all together. Sure. Why did he shoot Dr. Stephen Albert, his friend? Sure. Because in the newspaper it would say, man... Shot the like, you know, sinologist, like, blah blah blah, Dr. Albert. And Albert was the town where the artillery park was going to be. So mm. the German intel was able to pick that up and then go along and destroy the artillery park. Right. So, Sun, he yeah. get his name as the papers. The chief back in Berlin would put it all together that Sun randomly shot a guy named Albert yeah. to relay that that's the name where the artillery park was. And the sure. story ends with Sun with the with the noose around his neck on the gallows about to be executed, right? For killing Dr. Stephen Albert. Okay. That's it. Now, what do you guys want to say before I go, I go into some of the, the the reasons why I think Borges may have a rhizomatic theory of time and what that looks like? Yeah, let's let's go into that because I think yeah, that's the dangerous. real that's the real heart of the matter here is dealing with this idea of time. So let's let's go for it. Okay, so let's talk about this for a second. The first passage I came to, it starts off the essay, the short story, whatever we're calling it. On page 22 of Liddell Hart's History of World War I, you will read that an attack against the Sarah Montalban line by 13 British divisions supported by 1,400 artillery pieces planned for the 24th of July 1916 had to be postponed until the morning of the 29th. The, the torrential rains, Captain Liddell Hart's comments, caused this delay. Okay. An insignificant one, to be sure. Okay. So there is a delay of five days before trench warfare can be unleashed. We're talking about World War I. And, and Borges is saying here that that's just an insignificant delay. When a battle of that magnitude is delayed, it is far from insignificant. So in what sense would a rhizomatic theory of time allow for an event of that magnitude to be deemed insignificant. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Why yeah. would that? Why would that be the case? Yeah. It this reminds me of Marcus Aurelius, right? Where he's like, wait one year, like you know, have one year to live or twenty seconds. It doesn't really matter. That there is some sort of thing where it doesn't really matter what happens. It's all equal in some way. Where there's not some kind of center or inevitability that if you live longer, that's going to mean something, or if you live shorter that that's worse it's it's all there's no qualitative well, why why sense. why because it's all the same I mean, why like, is it what's all, all the same all repetitive it's what's like, it repeating the same probably a, a same if not very similar battle the same destructive magnitude uh, uh, one exactly. universe over yeah. right like if everything is splitting in all these different directions right 
like yeah, that means that all just happening in different spots. That means that every possible world is happening, mm -hmm. right? And so, what are the implications of this, right? It means that your agency and the thing that you're involved in at that moment, on this sort of theory, hit the space bar, me means a lot less, right? So. There, the magnitude of decisions don't seem to matter as much because there's a version of you doing something that else. is doing it or is, is victorious in this battle, loses in this battle, fights it to a draw, makes this decision, shoots the guy, doesn't shoot the guy, is your friend, isn't your friend. It's all mm -hmm. taken care of. There's mm -hmm. there's going to be a version of yourself. Mm -hmm. So that's why these mm -hmm. details... He, and, he, and then again, this is repeated. Very Not too long from there, he says, and this is Sun writing, or Sun. Through the window, I saw the familiar roofs and the cloud-shaded six o'clock sun. It seemed incredible to me that day without the de that day without premonitions or symbols should be the one of my inexorable death. In spite of my dead father, in spite of having been a child in a symmetrical garden of Haifeng, was I now going to die? His death is totally uneventful because it's accounted for in so many different places, right? Like this isn't this massive event that's going to go down. He is one of an infinite amount of sons that will live, be annihilated, go on doing the same. Things matter less and less on this rhizomatic theory of time. Okay? Now, the really interesting thing about this, right, the coalescing aspect. Okay? There are many passages within this that talk about how son is haunted by not only his ancestors, right? Like we know that he's fighting against, the, he's doing what he's doing, the espionage, for the sake of like his entire race, right? Mm -hmm. Like all those selves. But he, there are times when he realizes that he could go this way or that way and they're all sort of concurrent with him. He, they're like ghosts that he can almost reach out and touch. And what I, what I take that as, like I'm trying to find like the, like there are several instances of this. Um, like for instance, then I reflected that everything happens to a man precisely now. Centuries of centuries and only in the present do things happen. Countless men in the air, on the face of the earth and the sea, and all that really is happening is happening to me. So whatever decision he makes, he's experiencing it all at once because they all sort of come collapsing back on him. They all go out and they all come back. And so like, and, and I feel like that resounds with what our experiences are like. Think about the major decisions that you've made in your life. Mm -hmm. Does that person that did that went this way rather than that way does that person not seem to follow you around a little bit does that person not seem to haunt you a little bit yeah. does it not seem to be that all of you have come together in one body yeah. and in we some just way? call and we just call that person regret right <laughs> I, I don't know if it's regret regret or something like that but well, he's sort yeah, of, you could have done this it's like that potentiality yeah. Yeah, you could have done this but you didn't and you're like man I wish I could have done that I wish mm -hmm. I could have been that person right and the other, so not only does that sort of in a way explain this idea that we feel sworn by ourselves within the labyrinth of time, right? Okay, there's that. But then there's this other thing. He's, son thinks to himself as he goes about executing this plan to execute Dr. Stephen Albert in order to reveal the British Artillery Park. He says, the author of an atrocious, atrocious undertaking ought to imagine that he has already accomplished it ought to impose upon himself a future as irrevocable mm -hmm. as the past. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this idea being that, like, if it's all taken care of, if there are Jordan and CJs, one universe over and this and that, everything is sort of scripted and fixed. We just, it's just less real to us, mm -hmm. right? Like, like it's already in existence mm -hmm. in some way. Right. It almost seems like the Nietzschean or I suppose Greek and antiquity idea of amor fati right where you are it, it's more just about becoming what you are supposed to be already like you're just fulfilling like you said what's already happened like you said the future is already there and i'm just it's almost like i'm on the roller coaster and enjoying the ride is amor fati right it's, it almost seems like that in some way and maybe yeah 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 strange. but i mean and this can be a really dangerous yeah, idea too what do you want to say well because i was just thinking about you know like simone de beauvoir right it's all about agency and sort of an ethical framework so what is that i guess like what's the significance of like any sort of action good or bad if it's just kind of happening in some sort of parallel universe like the 
good and bad potentialities are already played out in an action that you're carrying out. Yeah, I mean that's the thing, right? Like, is where, that where does, where it does de- ethical conduct like fit Simone? Would, Simone de Beauvoir would hate this, yeah. right? Because Simone de Beauvoir was saying that she we should have like a heart attack. Why, <laughs> and why don't you explain to people why Simone de Beauvoir would hate this? What did she hate about Christianity? Uh, it's just that like there's like this sort of like divine person to just sort of wipe away every action that you do, and that it's almost essentially every action is sort of this existential framework. Is that every action that you carry out is like a footprint left on the earth and it's just like irrevocable like you yeah. can't go back and fix it right there is no so like christians have another world right we right. there's like there's, there's atonement different, yeah, yeah there's so atonement there's, yeah it basically expunges any sort of bad deeds that you like carry out exactly right so right. like there is so there's like weird is weird right like we mm-hmm. have like we can have not only these splitting timelines but like on the christian sort of view there's like hierarchical different right. worlds right mm-hmm. there's like this world and like heaven and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And if you think that Simone de Beauvoir's concern was if there was another world, right, that our actions here would matter less and less. But she says as a as someone who doesn't subscribe to that, mm-hmm. like her, the actions matter more and more. She would hate this. Right. It's not so this only is from nineteen forty one and she wrote the Ethics of Ambiguity in, in what, forty eight? Yeah. So there's only there's only like a ten year, you know, time for like frame. So it's just so like fascinating to me to see sort of like this almost like predestined universe where nothing matters versus a universe where everything matters it it makes the problem even worse right because Mm -hmm. in on the christian view you only have like like a couple destinations right like you can go to heaven or hell uh, after this one Uh, on 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 the on the rhizomatic worldview right is that it can go out in all these different directions (laughs) and then come crazy cracked out ride (laughs) yeah there's an incredible diminishment of agency so you exactly you so you, you can still move yourself, but like you ultimately feel that every outcome is already accounted for. So right. you can't help but feel a certain sort of apathy, or son can't help right. but feel a certain sort of resignation or apathy in this, mm-hmm. which I guess raises the question about why he would go through it at all. But yeah, so I thought that was interesting. I, I keep going. Yeah, I'm talking sorry. too much. Keep going. So I thought this was interesting. The other sort of implication from having sort of a rhizomatic lens for reading the Garden of Forking Paths is the this idea that, and I, as someone who got deeply, deeply buried in the philosophy of time and the preparation of this, I mean, I was thinking about, you know, like all sorts of motor realism and non spatially temporally interacting causal worlds and God's yeah. eternal perception. That was a big thing, right? Leibniz posits that this is the best of all possible worlds and there's certainty that this is the best possible world although there is some question about how much latitude there is but he says that the reason why we have pain is that this is the best possible world because if god has certain metrics that we don't have right Mm -hmm. and then boethius in the constellation philosophy says that god like sits on a mountain he's outside of time Mm -hmm. and can perceive all of history but it's not it's necessary to him but not necessary to us Mm -hmm. What's interesting on the, there is a little bit of this going on when you get into the philosophy of time and you study things like the rhizomatic theory. The one I started to feel myself hovering above all the different splitting selves and all the coalescing selves, and and I believe Sun indicates that he too, as considering a theory of time and considering the Garden of Forking Paths novel that his ancestor wrote, he writes this. I thought of a labyrinth. This is his anticipation mm. to finding the action. Like he thinks that this is before the sinologist has revealed to him what that the, 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 the what actually is the Garden of Forking Pass. He's fantasizing about the, the garden and what it would be like. He says, "I thought of a labyrinth of labyrinths, of one sinuous spreading labyrinth that would encompass the past and the future in some way, involve the stars." Absorbed in these illusory images, I forgot my destiny of one pursued. I felt myself to be, for an unknown period of time, an abstract perceiver of the world. Mm-hmm. So in all this consideration of different splitting timelines and stuff like that, he is like almost taken out of time. He's almost given a he's almost given a godlike perspective because he can observe all the selves going through the maze of time. Yeah. And that's almost what his ancestor is doing by writing a novel about time right is that he's kind of standing outside of time depicting the universe just how time works as as he sees it which mm-hmm. which is very odd because it's almost like through reading the novel you are stepping out of time to glance at time yeah mm-hmm. which i think in some way right like so Borges's own garden of forking paths right 
does the exact same thing. Like I meant, I started off this whole conversation about how I'm having infinite experiences of it and I'm reading it different ways and mm-hmm. like I'm going in all these different directions yeah. with it. Like who knows what I'll discover the 8th, ninth, 10th, 11th time. Like it may go on for infinity. And that's the other interesting thing here, right? Is the rhizomatic concept of time an infinite one? Mm-hmm. So he says, Borges says, the book is an indeterminate... This is speaking of his, his ancestor's book. He says, The book is an indeterminate heap of contradictory drafts. I examined it once. In the third chapter, the hero dies. In the fourth, he is alive. Curious legend that Su Pen, this is his ancestor, which is interesting. I think that name means something. I think it might, in Chinese, sound more like Pan and Pan and Labyrinth. Uh, we're all familiar with uh, that association. Had planned to create a labyrinth which would be strictly infinite. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's the question. If you think about the puddle that is like with all its rivulets going out and coalescing and stuff like that, is it truly infinite? It's growing. That universe is growing. Mm-hmm. And this raises a lot of questions about cosmological origins. To me, and I'll, let, I'll cede the floor here. I want to hear what you guys have to think about this because I'm talking a lot. To me, so long as something is expanding outwards, coalescing and all this stuff, that seems to me that the universe is indefinite. It's not infinite. Mm. So if something were infinite, it would be like God and therefore eternal. But the universe seems to be spreading. It seems to go from a singularity and then go out in every direction and 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 have like these tentacles that then sort of like fuse into one another. Yeah, right? I think that's I think that's a great way to describe it because that's how we get it in this story as well because there's some some actions that happen in the story and then there's variations on that subtle action and then on upon that subtle action there are variations upon that and so on and so on and so on and like you said there's just streams and then the streams have little streams on themselves so it just keeps compounding where it's not so much that that there's a infinite number is that maybe there's a vast number yeah. right or yeah. I guess like a, a term by Daniel Dennett where it's just like it is it is determinable but it's indeterminably long and you're just kind of like this goes on forever but there is a stop it's innumerable it. yeah yeah so, yeah and so th- those are the main points that I wanted to bring out Jordan do you want to say anything about this concept of infinity yeah, yeah. I mean I don't know I'm just so fascinated between that tension between the indefinite and the infinite can yeah. you speak more to that, both of you? Yeah, I'm just like super, super intrigued. I, the way that I think about the indefinite is that something that defies the finite mind's conceptualization of it. Because that also seems like that also like implies like space. Like when you said infinite, that almost like yeah. Infers, well, like, there's a great you know, there's a great short yeah. story by Borges called The Library of Babel. Yeah. And and he says all of the books in the war, all the books that could be made. I mean, it's almost determined like where all the books that could be made are in the library mm-hmm. and and when we think about that it's like so imagine a copy of moby dick there is a copy of moby dick where there is one typo and then there's in in all like the hundred like 900 or so pages and then there's one where there's one typo and like and you can just all the variations mm-hmm. upon moby dick yeah are there is a limit but that limit like if we're just talking about one book in the whole library but like just one one book you can have this indeterminable mm-hmm. but determinable amount of variation within that mm-hmm. one book. So that's almost how so I it's ca- like outside yeah. of our realm of comprehension. Yeah, but space I do like the idea of space though. Well, or it is within our comprehension but it might take about a thousand lifetimes to actually, you know, or it just yeah. might take a long that. time before but you actually count it all out. I bet Google has a machine that could count the uh, the number of universes where uh, time forks perpetually toward innumerable futures, and one of them, I am your enemy, yeah. right? And that's the interesting thing, right? It seems like that's you and I. It just depends on the day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zing. I I mean that's the thing, right? Is that sun like feels. I, I, he feels like he is all these things at once going back to that swarming sensation that mm-hmm. closes it out. He says, once again, I felt the swarming sensation of which I have spoken. It seemed to me that the humid garden that surrounded the house was infinitely saturated with invisible persons. Those persons were Albert and I secret, busy and multiform in other dimensions of time. I raised my eyes and the tenuous nightmare dissolved. Yeah. So I love this. 
I love this. I love this 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 short story, this essay, this history lesson, this confession, this whatever it is. I love this. I'm glad you chose it. No, it's well, a, and I've gotten classic. I've gotten my ideas out there. What, yeah. what I'm gonna l- 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 let me let me let you guys do what you want to do with the text. That is how I understand it. Yeah, I mean, I, I like the idea of indefinite versus infinite, and maybe trying to continue off with the idea. Like, is, is there such thing as infinite? Are we dealing with infinite time, or is it just like we can't? possibly count all the variations there are of what could happen or that we can but it's just this number that's so high up in you know in counting or even calculating that it's impossible well not impossible but you know what i mean yeah i mean can, can, i mean can we say something about it i mean do, is it I mean, we're not we're not theoret- I mean, look, we're not theoretical physicists, but this no. is ha- this is haunting me. This is this is like yeah. This, this is- has haunted me since I was a little boy because theoretical physicists tell me that the universe is infinite, and in the same breath, they tell me about a big bang. Mm-hmm. And like, and ever since I was like five years old, I was like, that makes no sense. And I have throughout my life, I have encountered theoretical physicists, and I've been like, does the universe have an edge? And Seven out of ten of them will tell me no, because the implication <laughs> well, the implication would be because if they said the universe had an edge, I think the, the abstractly they would have to say then the universe is expanding into something, mm-hmm. right? And if something is expanding into something, the something is what, yeah, right? Or, yeah. Like it's like is it right? What's going on there, right? right. And so yeah. then the answer to me from my theoretical <laughs> physics. Encounters. Oh, they've said to they've said to me, if you knew the math, you would understand that the universe doesn't have an edge. You just can't pop. So the cop out has been: don't try to f- make it a philosophical issue. The math says that the universe is infinite, and I can't philosophically put it into words. Now, maybe one day we'll take up a philo- physic philo- a philosopher who does physics because they are such there are such individuals mm-hmm. who out there who has wrestled with this particular issue but it's never made sense to me even since i was yeah. a young boy and even even to go along with that too there's that idea where it's like if the, the universe is infinite and is made of fine a finite amount of things which goes with that idea we're like okay so then is it like that finite amount of things just like reoccurring again and again well that's nietzsche's right? idea of eternal return and right. that in that sense you have like so if 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 the universe so there's the big bang and then it goes out and then it like gravity causes it to collapse back mm-hmm. in on itself. We're not talking about splitting timelines. We're right. just talking about expansion and contraction. If that, you know, if that's like accepted fact in <laughs> physics because I we'll see if the universe I guess collapses on itself one day. I guess it will. I guess that's what they say. Anywho, Allegedly. right. So this could be this conversation that we're having right now for Nietzsche. This could be the first time that Luke, CJ, and Jordan have ever discussed eternal return, or this could be the hundred thousandth time. And maybe I don't know if Nietzsche would say this because I, I think he think he wants us to act in such a way that every time there's a repetition of the universe, every moment we have to live in a life affirming way in order to sort of maximize the value of our own existence. Right. Maybe it's the same conversation over and over again. But then you have this other sort of infinity, right? So there's this, there's our universe, but then you have stacks of universes that keep growing outward in this way. Mm. But it's not infinite. It, it too would be indefinite because it would be expanding from one. It would just be, instead of like there being just the big bang and collapse of that one universe, there would be that single Universe, and then it expands to hundreds of thousands of universes. So mm-hmm. that are so that are, that are that are expanding and contracting so. within time. And maybe they're happening. Maybe it's all happening <laughs> contemporaneously. Maybe you know, mm. you know. Maybe it's not that they're falling in line with some ultimate god time, mm-hmm. where each universe expands and collapses. Maybe there are a hundred thousand worlds expanding and contracting. Simultaneously, and I think that's what that, makes. And that would yeah. be. And by the way, that would be David Lewis. I think that would be David Lewis's view in the modal realism. But he oh. says you can't hop into the other worlds. Uh, yeah. Like they are spatio-temporal. They, they don't interact whatsoever. So, you, you, so. Well, I think that's what makes. Um, 
son's ancestors novel so confounding for ev- for everybody that's quote unquote read it you know in the yeah. story where they're like we don't know what to make of this this book that our ancestors wrote is that it has that you know it goes it expands vertically where it's like we get different variations upon the same thing and then it expands outward where it's just like and then each or it seems like throughout as we're expanding there are these different vertical variations that just keep going and then maybe on some of these verticals we get another horizontal and god yeah. forbid another mm-hmm. hor- another vertical and then another horizontal and it's just like ah oh. well that, that's I that's more I can deal with that more than the fact that then they might the, then they, they might, might start collapsing back. coalescing into one another yeah because the true. question is how do the how does it, how do individuals in separate universes become one person how do like 50 CJs right. that coalesce become, become into one body that's true. Yeah, you get this mashing of worlds into one reality. Well, that's 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 the cool part of the story, right? That you're talking about. I think I think your theory was when Doctor Albert reached into the yes drawer before Sun shot him was that he also had a revolver. Well, he, he might have. We he don't. Might have. We don't but, know. But if we're going along with our theory, is that he had the revolver and maybe he was thinking about shooting him, or maybe he wasn't. That there that. Within that drawer, we have thousands of variations of what could have happened, right? Because he could have just reached in and grabbed the letter, shot him. He could have reached in, grabbed the letter, turned around, shot him. He could have reached in, grabbed the letter, turned around, said a couple words, shot him. And then, like, who knows what variations he could have told yeah, son that- before he shot him. Or he could have grabbed the revolver, and then they both kill each other, shot in the arm, shot in the leg. Yeah. You know, like... Both shoot each other in the head. Like, yeah, what? yeah, yeah. I will have to say that uh. this, this idea that maybe he was reaching for a gun or something like that. I did pick that up from a lecture from UT Austin. Well, that that's a great little uh, yeah, yeah, find. I, I, but, and consequently, I do believe. I think Borges briefly taught at, at UT Austin. That's cool. I, I think I think that may that he may have been he a lecturer. Did some lectures in, yeah, yeah. in America. I think he did. But there are so many other things to talk about with this story. I mean, I think we've covered a, lo- a lot of a lot of the big ideas. But can you give one more brief thing? Like, sure. You sure. say like, what's another thing you said you can talk about? With this oh story? my God, man! Um, what what could what could I talk about? I, I mean, we could talk about whether or not his plan was truly successful. Mm-hmm. Like, did he really alert the Germans to the artillery park, uh... or or was it just a coincidence? Like they found out. Like, he assumes, like, he's about to swing from the gallows. He assumes that his plan, he, that, that, that he causally brought the attention of the, of, brought it to the chief's attention in Berlin. The artillery park was in Albert. But do we really know that he did that? Or did they figure that out completely separate from his whole effort? And what does that say about causal determinacy in time and all of these other things, right? Yeah, there's yeah. a there's a there's a you know the thing about I, like the narrative fallacy, right? Yeah, where, it, where it's just like you think you do a certain th- you have like you said there's certain causes and with that certain effects, but sometimes X does not mean that Y is going to be the output, yeah. right? Yeah, and that and that's almost like how the story starts, right? Where you're like, okay, and then he finds Doctor Alberts. It's like was that? I mean, how you set it up was like was that just like an accident? That was just a coincidence. I think he, it was a strange coincidence. I think or, he just he just he, I think he chose Albert out of the phone book, and then what's the strange? Maybe we can talk about the faded nature right, of destiny. it. Right. Like yeah. the, the fact. I mean, out of all the Alberts you could have picked out of the phone book, he picks someone who's an expert on his own culture, yeah. who's intimately acquainted with his own ancestors' work. Like, what are the chances of that happening? So we have this idea of chance and destiny yeah. kind yeah. of yeah. playing yeah. on two sides of the same coin, or they are one side that has just oh, joined mm. together and coagulated into this weird thing where you think some things actually happen by chance and maybe it's by destiny if you think some things happen by destiny and they're actually just chance it's too statistically improbable it seems yeah. destined yeah. but on a so then the question is how do you have destiny within <laughs> a, a rhizomatic theory of time like you usually yeah. talk about destiny if what 
Right. If, if there's a god, a right? Linear, yeah, there's like yeah. a god or some sort of like divine planner. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And like we don't get there's the yeah. we don't get the sense in this story that there is someone who's orchestrating the events. Right. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean it's statistically so improbable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you know, I mean I think the great part about this story and I can't remember who said it, but they said that a good I can't even remember if it was a good artist or a good poet. They said like a good poet well, let's say a good a good writer. A good writer starts with an answer and ends with a riddle. And I think that's kind of like what we're left with with this story in particular is that maybe we're like, okay, it's about this. That's it. And then once we dig into the surface, we're just left with more questions. And mm. we're kind of like, this is just a riddle about time. And we don't know what the hell's going on. And it leaves us wanting more and just leaves us in this crazy mind frame. Oh, I I highly recommend people reading it over and over again. Yeah. It mm-hmm. it's it's yes. it's not one of those things that you understand like if you cover I I think I I think I have a pretty good command of it right now, but like I I would not say that what I have is like exhaustive or authoritative. And I don't know no. if if I will ever have that. No. I don't I don't think I don't think I will ever have that with this with this mm-hmm. story. And that I, I, it makes me want to know how is Borges able to do that? Like, where, how do you teach that? How do you develop that skill? Where you, you just the, the 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 you you create a different every time that the 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 essay or short story is read, you get a different experience of it. Mm-hmm. Now, maybe you could say the same thing happens with Harry Potter. I doubt it. I haven't read Harry Potter. I'm not. I'm. 36 years old. Is yeah, that happening with Harry Potter? It's, uh, it's been a while since I've read it, but maybe not. <laughs> but this is a special skill, right, of Borges's, yeah. right? Or it could be, if we want to take it in a different way, maybe it's a very special skill of the reader. Yeah. Right? Or if, if we go like a Foucault, a Foucault or a Bart sort of thing, where maybe actually, or maybe a Bart, where it's like, Maybe we're not supposed. We're not saying like, oh, the author has given us all of these different possibilities. It's actually the reader mm-hmm. that opens the door to many possibilities. And I think Borges would say that too. That mm-hmm. I mean, like we've yeah, looked at Pierre Menard, where you can take one text and find so many different angles and nuances from having a different perspective on it each time that you look at it. And maybe every time you look at it, you are going to have another perspective. Mm-hmm. But yeah. it's, it's perhaps maybe something more we have to attribute to the reader. And I think maybe Borges would agree. And maybe, and I, I, we think, you know, Bart and all the other people we've looked at for critical theory would agree as well. But yeah. It's interesting. It's, it's such it a is. Borges move, right? Mm-hmm. Like, it's like the, the deletion of Borges from... It, in the celebration of the reader is so Borges, right? It's like we were listening. We were listening to the the song "I Love Kanye," yeah. right? It's, how's the how's the line go? Like I can't he's he's like what I like the old Kanye. Wouldn't Kanye like write a song about being Kanye? Like that would be so Kanye. <laughs> yeah. Like like he's like he he's like saying I'm not there, but in the affirmation oh, of that negation. Is, is the reimagination of this mythical author that's yeah. the, that has a theological status. Borges is like this master to me, mm-hmm. and he's all about deleting himself from his writing. I, I he's probably he keeps creeping up the echelon for me. Yeah, and and he has for you too. Obviously, I don't know how about yeah. what Jordan oh, thinks. Oh, oh yeah, you, you're growing oh. in appreciation of him. Oh yeah, I mean he's just like this like just ninja architect of, of I, I, I know I, what. I, I swear, I mean, <laughs> I'll go uh, back to the reader function. I feel like it's just like, because he's such a good reader that like mm-hmm. he can draw from so much from like, from the Bible to, you know, Kant and all these different things in between. And I'll talk about Schopenhauer in our, in the story. And he throws oh yeah, he did talk and about he throws Schopenhauer. In Goethe, and it's like, he throws mm-hmm. in all these different things and Some it's not even, it's not even, yeah. it's not mm-hmm. even that he has breath, but he also has depth yeah. Yeah. and Absolutely. all of those things that mm-hmm. what better, what better way to be? I mean, it almost gives us this idea where it's like to be a good writer, 
is to be a good reader. Just mm-hmm. as being a good musician is to be a good listener. Yeah. And, it, and you, you can attest to this yeah. too, where if you have this wealth of knowledge to choose from, that you can in some way craft these very complicated or very nuanced pieces without having to say like, yeah, it's all completely original. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I would claim that maybe Borges isn't the most quote-unquote original author, but that he can pull all of these different things together and link them up in certain like especially with aspects of time and I think I've alluded to you guys that he does have some nonfiction about time that maybe we can explore later but that he can do that like that's his originality yeah. and that's what makes him special even if like you said it's like the story is very kind of like detective novel-y like where you're just like oh and he shoots him and he's like ah. yeah. just kidding where it's kind of like espionage, espionage novel but then there's like this depth that you're just like oh my god we spent about 50 minutes talking about this you know it's yeah. crazy yeah well I'm spent yeah I just what about you Jordan you wanna you wanna close it out any parting thoughts I don't know, I'm like freaking out. <laughs> right? Don't I'm just up to like three in the morning reading this. Uh, do you feel yourself kind of hovering above yourself? I, I don't know how I feel. I, yeah, it, this is, I feel really great, but weird. And I'm going to just reread this like a yeah. hundred times. No, it's, that's the really effect just, he has on yeah. you. I swear it's like, it's to me, it's like, I'm, I've never had He's drugs, working. but I'm like, this is better than any drugs. This is like some like mm-hmm. Borges stories, like take you it's to that intellectual drug. ecstasy yeah. and you're just like, you don't want to come down yeah, from this it. Is, this is... I smoked a um, cigarette once when I was 16. This is better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I got jokes. Bye guys. Download the Noetic app for Droid, iPhone. Hit, hit stop. We're going to hit stop. <laughs>